Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Our 10-minute speaker is Lauren S. from San Diego. Well, there's a lot of people here. Uh, my name's Lauren. I'm an alcoholic. And um, let's see. So what it was like. I started drinking when I was 13, and I had my first drunk in Mexico. Um, for me, my first drunk was a real preview for what it was going to be like for the rest of my drinking career. Um, I felt free. I felt, um, intoxicated with just like, you know, this kind of feeling like I was doing something naughty and it was really thrilling and I could kind of get away with doing things that I couldn't normally get away with because I think that I felt like I was someone else, you know, like it wasn't really happening or it wasn't really me or something like that. And, um, you know, and then I, I woke up the next day and I felt shame and guilt and, I was having to hide what had happened from my mom because I was on a trip with her and some family members. And, um, you know, and that really did set the tone for what the rest of my drinking career would be. Um, I started to hang out with people who, uh, drink. Well, I wouldn't say they drink like me. I would say that they made it feel normal for me to drink that the way that I drink. Um, and, um, and yeah, I think that I don't really remember a lot of high school drinking. I do know that there was high school drinking because I made an amends to my grandpa recently. And he said to me, you know, in high school, we just kind of thought that was, you know, you being a high schooler and that, that you would, um, grow out of that. But we realized when you went off to college, like this was a serious problem. And I'm kind of like, what the hell happened in high school? Like, I don't remember <laughs> much, but I mean, there were some incidents that stand out in my mind. Like I remember of being a freshman and like walking in and, um, my mom was standing there at the door waiting for me and I was like, shit. And she's like, you know, you reek of alcohol. And I'm like, well, yeah, like someone spilled a drink on me. And then I proceeded to throw up on the floor in front of her. So, um, you know, I remember some things happening like that, but to me, like it really did seemed to me that that's what you did. You know, you were, I was young and I thought that was just part of that experience is, you know, you drink and you party and I didn't want to miss out on anything. And, um, and I loved drinking. I loved the whole environment. I loved the scene, you know, like I loved going out and being social and I just kind of felt like this great, happy feeling and, I just always wanted more of that. Like I never wanted it to end. I just wanted more and more and more. And I did not ever have that thing inside of me that said like, okay, you know, you're good. <laughs> like you don't need to keep drinking like for this to be fun. And, um, and so, you know, I always drink until I passed out. Um, it didn't matter where I was when I passed out, I passed out in bars and on streets and in super inappropriate places that you shouldn't choose to sleep at. Um, I went to, um, Santa Barbara city college briefly and, (laughs) um, a lot happened in a really short amount of time. And I, I did a lot of things that I never in a million years would have done sober. Um, I think that I, you know, surprised myself. I definitely surprised my friends and family. Um, but I was so removed from the situation. Like I just, it was like someone, like I was looking at someone else in someone else's life and I was in huge denial. I mean, it took a long time for me to even like kind of acknowledge that anything that had happened really did happen. And, um, and I really, I still really didn't think it was a problem. Like I really still thought like, this is just what you do when you're young. And so, um, so anyways, I ended up having to come to go back up to Marin where I um, went to high school and live with my parents because, uh, well, I was kicked out of the dorms and I was kicked out of school and basically kicked out of Santa Barbara. And um, they came and got me. And my mom is um, a, a substance abuse counselor. And so she <laughs> she told me that, or she was at the time, and she told me that 
you know, on my, my condition for living back at home, um, was that I had to be an outpatient treatment and I had to go to AA every single day. And I said, okay, because I really didn't feel like I had any other option. And I was really desperate. I wasn't a desperate place and I was desperate to grab onto anything that would explain what had happened. And, um, so I did, I grasped onto that. And I'm like, okay, I can do that. And so I did, well, I kind of did. I, Went to AA, um, and I, uh, didn't do the outpatient because I really didn't want to. And so I went in and I totally bombed the interview. And then I went to my mom and said, well, they didn't let me in. So, you know, I tried. And, um, so anyways, I did that for like a month and a half. And then I decided that I was, you know, once I kind of got feeling okay again, like the shame kind of slipped away and the guilt and all of that, I started to feel like, you know, I think that it's not really drinking. Like I don't, I'm not really an alcoholic. I just have some problems that I need to work through in therapy. And, um, once I do that, I'll be fine. And I don't want to miss out on all this stuff. I'm 18. Like, I just don't want to miss out. So, you know, maybe, you know, even if I am an alcoholic, like I'll address that later in life. Like I can't, I don't want to miss out. So I'm just going to drink. And so I did. And, um, you know, it, (laughs) it got right back to where it was and then some, and I did that for, for, I don't know, like from 18 until 27. Um, and there was a lot of wreckage that was caused. There was a lot of, uh, there was a lot, you know, I was a blackout drinker. So pretty much every time I drank, I blacked out, I would wake up. I felt so much shame. I was constantly in damage control mode. I was like, you know, checking my phone, like, who did I text? Who did I piss off? Like checking my bank account? Like, do I have any money left? Like, where's my car? Um, and, you know, getting in the car and like seeing parts of my car in the car, wondering how that happened. Um, it's like a miracle that I never got a DUI. Um, I drove drunk all the time and, you know, and I justified it because the taxi ser- service just sucked in Marin. And so it was like their fault, you know, um, but, um, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of lost friendships and relationships and my, my family relationships were strained, but it was like this elephant in the room always. Um, I just pretended like everything was fine. And I had these two separate lives. There was like my life where I went to school and I worked and I somehow managed to do all that. And then there was like my party life and those were two separate things. And, um, and, and then, you know, it was an elephant. And even with friends that like, you know, knew, knew what it was like, um, I had one, like, try and tell me what it was like, and then I just, you know, stopped being friends with her because I thought she was just being a bitch, and she was just jealous because, you know, she didn't have the freedom that I had and all that, and so, so anyways, I need to fast forward, so what happened? Um, I, uh, well, let's see, a lot of stuff happened. Um, there were a lot of things that happened that, you know, I you, you would look back and would think that would, um, would be like a wake-up call. I Um, was hospitalized a few different times for alcohol poisoning. Once I fell asleep on Garnett street and, uh, woke up the next day in bed, only knew I had been in the hospital because of the wrist brand on me. And, uh, I had a a pissed off boyfriend who had to come pick me up. Um, anyways, so fast forward, (laughs) um, Last, last day of drinking, I had been on like a five day bender and, um, I woke up, it was Monday morning. I had missed something really important for school and I felt, you know, the same, the very similar desperation and all that, that I had often felt. Um, and this time though, what was different is that I had a friend come over who was in my school program with me and, um, we happened to be focusing on solution focused counseling. And so she's solution focused, counseled me. And the only solution to all my problems was to simply not drink. Like I, all my problems were directly related to drinking. And so, um, you know, it just became clear. Like I, I surrendered in that moment. I said, you know, this is the only way that all these things are going to stop happening. So I, um, I decided then and there that I was no longer going to drink. And it felt like, um, I felt a lot of grief. I spent a week grieving and, um, and yet, and feeling really scared about what was to come, but also feeling a giant sense of release and relief because I felt like it was over. And, um, you know, I called my parents right away. I knew I had to tell everyone. Otherwise I could talk myself into re making that decision. Um, and, um, you know, now it's been two and a half 
plus years. I got sober on 11, 15, 11. Um, and my life is dramatically different. Like I, you know, I have bad days, I have bad weeks, but it is nothing compared to what it was. I have, um, a really blessed life today. And, you know, I have friends in this program that I can sit down and have like real meaningful conversations with and who, um, it, there's just so much honesty there and so much love. And, um, you know, I have a great relationship with my family or again, it's like so much honesty and openness and, and that wasn't the way it was before. And, um, you know, I have a great relationship and, um, there's a lot, a lot of good things now today. So, uh, thanks for letting me share. I'm probably done. <laughs> My name is Robert. I'm an alcoholic. Great. Right? Good to see you. And I certainly appreciate Damien asking me to be the 10 minute speaker. I, uh, I love talking about myself and, uh, and I, and I love that everybody, I could feel everybody was cheering you on as you were, you were reading your, uh, format. And, uh, you know, that's what I love about AA is that we're all here, you know, rooting each other on for one more day of sobriety that your sobriety doesn't take anything away from me. It adds to my enjoyment of the fellowship. And, uh, <clears throat> I used to have a really bad stutter as a kid and it was terrible. And, um, oh, my sobriety date is, uh, July 8th, 1996. So I've been, uh, you know, gratefully happy birthday to all the birthday recipients. Uh, that's, uh, you know, we were talking be- before the meeting that it seems like the, the real, they say the treasure is under the X, meaning in the first 10 years, that's where you see the most growth. And, uh, you know, and I remember the first, like, especially the first five years, it just seemed like my life was just changing my leaps and bounds. I mean, just not having a hangover, you know, like New Year's Day. I had forgot somebody mentioned that. You remember, remember hangovers? And I'm like, especially in college, I go to the dining hall and, you know, I was just trying to eat food to absorb all the acid and, oh, man, you're still drunk and you're like, and I hadn't learned about the morning drink. You know, you guys taught me about that. I've learned a lot about drinking in AA and uh, I'd be danger if I went back, dangerous if I went back out there again. So I, uh, I think I'm just going to stay here. You know, I go to meetings to see what's working for people and what's not working for people. And I see a lot of what doesn't work, um, you know, and this thing gets worse over time. It's progressive. It's progressing even if you're not, you're not drinking. That's a scary thought. You know, I, you know, 17 and a half years without a drink or a drug, um, you know, I was thinking, you know, what, what I was like before, what happened and what I'm like now instead of what it's like, you know, I, heard a New Year's Eve speaker talking about that and you know what I used to be like I my my vision of what drinking and drug and when it worked when I was living in PB and a two bedroom apartment I was sharing with the ex fraternity brother I had a water bed queen size water bed I had a I had a full size true view uh, aquarium as my headboard and I had my bong on the side or my my smoking apparatus thing on the side. It was a grateful dead. It was beautiful. It was a birthday. It was a Christmas present from my sister. And it, uh, the carb was in the bow tie. It was awesome. And I love that thing. It was, it was a sad day when I had to shatter it because I knew I couldn't have it in my possession and not slip back to those old slippery ways. So, uh, um, you know, I'd wake up on a Saturday morning, wake and bake, couple beers and a Marlboro Light 100, baby. And I'd be you know, and that was about as good as the whole weekend got, you know, and, and at the end of my drinking, the best my drinking was, was the half hour before I started drinking was the thought that relief is coming, you know, and as soon as I drank, you know, especially after I can't come to A after my first DUI, I really had a strong sense that I was the real deal. And it took a second DUI to really, uh, wake me up to the fact that I'm going to, when I drink, there's no guarantee of how this is going to go. And it's scary when you can't trust yourself to not get behind the wheel or not, you know, get in legal trouble again. And, uh, you know, in college it was fun. And then, you know, at 28 years old, when I finally kind of came in here and surrendered, um, you know, I heard, like, it was interesting. I was going to a noon meeting where the secretary would say, hey, if you got a court slip and you want me to sign it now, I'll gladly sign it and you can get out of here and go drink because, you know, the seat you're sitting in is is an expensive seat and we paid a high price to be here. And if you don't want to be here, you know, we don't want you here. And I was like, wow, that's a very different message than I was hearing in my face-to-face meetings and my group get-togethers and mad mothers or whatever, you know, that, they, you know, you had to be there and they were going to tell you and this place was telling me, 
you know, go get done. Drink as much as you need to drink to, you know, finally be as desperate as the dying can be so you can, you know, finally come in and join us. Because if you're not done, if you really don't want to get sober, this thing doesn't work, you know. And uh, and I really get that. We had a meeting the other day about willingness or this morning. And, uh, um, and for me, willingness is... You know, when my sponsor said, do you want to get sober? You know, you're going to have to ask yourself that almost every morning you wake up. Say, is today a day when you're willing to prioritize your sobriety above everything else? Because if I put AA first and God in the center of my life and make it first, everything that comes second is first class. And it's, it's, um, I don't know, it's, it's worked for a long time now. And it's amazing how I had so many problems when I came in here. And a lot of those problems just go away from just not drinking. But there's still a lot of problems that have, you know, it's like you stick the finger in that hole in the dam and suddenly three more spring out. And, uh, you know, there's if there's a 12-step program associated with it, I'm a contender. <laughs> I love that. Who's <laughs> that? Leo Booth talks about that. He goes, uh, you know, from gamblers to to, um, I don't know, he, he's pretty funny. But uh, uh, I won't go there. But, um, you know, it's... Uh, you know, it's a great way of life here. Um, you know, what happened? I think that second DUI, the counselor said, you know, if you got a first DUI, there's a there's a chance you may have made a, you know, bad judgment call. You could have, uh, you know, just got behind, you know, got behind the wheel, you know, on a bad night. But if you got a second DUI, there's a really good chance you probably drink and drive a lot more than twice in your life. And, uh, you know, and I was that guy. I had a stick shift pickup truck, and I... There was a beer between my legs a lot of the times when I was driving, and I always had a sneak a toke somewhere in my center console. Sorry, that's just part of my story. I shouldn't share that at AA, but um, I love that stuff, and it still haunts me. That stuff haunts me more than than the drinking. So uh, I definitely need to be here, and um, so I kind of started looking at that. You know, maybe you know, and then the idea of the allergic reaction. You know, especially now, I, I never hung out with social drinkers, but now. I'm around people that drink socially and I don't, you know, they don't get that. Let's get, you know, that, that need to, you know, these buying rounds drives me crazy. Even back then, you know, it's like, you know, I'm done and I'm waiting for, you know, whose turn is it? Your turn, you know, let's go. <laughs> you know, I don't know if I had a, you know, an issue with evaporation or what, but I, you know, you know, my, my ice cubes hardly even rounded off and I was just, you know, and, until I got to that bloated, like, I'm going to go throw up in the bathroom, I wasn't done. And uh, so I don't know. It's um, I definitely know I, I belong here. And um, and the tough thing is staying here. You know, I see so many people come in, you know, they get, oh, don't drink. Okay, I think I got it. Now, you know, I'm going to go back to my life, you know. But, uh, you know, it's there's a lot more to not drinking than just not drinking. And I'm glad I heard a lot about the steps from the people taking uh, – the tokens. I I definitely am a big believer that uh, you know I need to you know rework the steps more than once. I need to sponsor guys and work the steps with them when I sponsor them. I I sponsor guys because I need sanity in my life. I I'm not looking. You know, it is kind of nice when you get to be part of somebody else's sobriety and God's in the mix with that. And you you get that one on one time and you see him get it, which is so rare. I mean, it's. For all the guys I've sponsored, you know, maybe one out of 20, and that's a pretty good odd, I think. So, um, you know, when I see a newcomer struggling, I, I I give them my number, and I get their number, and I call them and say, hey, you know, because um, – so if you're new and you don't have a sponsor, give somebody else the opportunity to get well, too. Because, you know, just being here and not drinking a day at a time for a while, your life gets good, but there's – it's still, you know, life is uncomfortable and the disease morphs over time. It's still, you get into, you know, the person that's suffering in the rooms of AA can be that old timer sitting next to you as well. So, um, I don't know. I really, I've kind of come back to sponsoring being really important for me and, um, and, you know, going through those steps. Um, and even the traditions, I like that. So, um, what else? So just, uh, you know, um, it's a day at a time, and uh, but it's a great way of life. I love it. I love traveling, going to uh, meetings in other countries, um, you know, and having that freedom to not be my own worst enemy. I mean, I, you know, if if drinking didn't do for me what it did, I wouldn't have let it do to me for as long as it did. You know, it, uh, 
You know, I, I love that. It turns turned me from Elmer Fudd to James Bond, you know. <laughs> you know, I got that swagger, and I just didn't care, you know. It g- gave me that armor where I could, uh, you know, kind of be fearless. So, uh, you know, I, I love the, the rooms here, and I love that, you know, you're up here being, uh, you know, uh, fearless and just, uh, you know, and that we're all rooting you on. We're all rooting all of us on. And, uh, you know, there's not many places in the world where you got people that are really, you know, in your corner, you know, wishing that you have a good life and, uh, and you know, stay here. I think that's for me. You know, even when I get to a point where I'm just bored with whatever, you know, I need to switch a meeting or something, I just keep coming back, and 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 it's about you know the one on one. You know, for me, it's meetings are important and service is important. But if I'm not spending some time in my week one on one with another alcoholic, you know, like Bill and Bob did with the guy on the bed, you know, there's something missing in my program. So um, that's way too much out of me. Thanks for letting me share. My name is Ski. I'm an alcoholic. And. Uh, I came, I come into the program in 1959, and I was in it for four years, and then, but a little over four years. And, uh, I went out and I drank for two hours. I drank two hours and, uh, came back the next day. The way I, I did that was, uh, I was, a uh, I was a Marine when I come into the program. And, uh, I just retired from MCRD, uh, or rather Pendleton. And I was, uh, a gunnery sergeant when I retired. And, uh, I loved the, the Marine Corps, but, uh, I got out and I had to go to the post office. I got into the post office and got another good job. And, uh, so while I was at the post office, they put me on nights. Uh, I was working nights, uh, and they were telling me that I'd have to work six days a week with no overtime. Yeah. You just got straight time if you were a sub. And, uh, so I had to work six days a week. Till midnight from three in the afternoon. And, uh, as I did this, I was missing meetings and it got easier and easier to miss meetings. And I had over four years when that one day came when I was driving a special delivery wagon. I drove a special delivery wagon and it was a good job. We had real light, no heavy mail and, uh, I thought it was great, except it cut off my meetings. And I, I went to, you know, meetings on top. I, I had one, one a week, and that wasn't enough for me. To, that was Sunday. And I, uh, I got to where I, 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 uh, I was talking to myself driving a, a station wagon. I was saying, nothing's happening to me, nothing good, nothing bad, nothing's happening. And by the time I got off work, I said, I said, if nothing happens by Saturday, I'm going to make something happen. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll show them for not paying attention to me anymore. I thought they should treat me like a newcomer, you know. And uh, I said, uh, I'll get even with them. Yeah, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get even with them. I'll kill them and, you know. I, I, what I wanted to do was uh, punish them, you know, for goofing me up. So and by the time I got off work, I said, "Why wait till Saturday?" And, uh, <laughs> uh, and I went to I went to 17th Street, the bar in the basement down there. And, uh, I went in there, and 
got drunk. I didn't, I didn't get any drinks from them, but I walked in and I shook and trembled so badly that I couldn't ask for a drink. And I walked out the door without drinking. And I thought, what are you, a man or a mouse? Why are you scared? And I drove down to the Chi-Chi Club. <laughs> All the high places. You know. And uh, I said, I walked in there, and I, on the way there, I was saying the serenity prayer to give me the courage to drink. <laughs> and I went in there, and I had a shot of whiskey, and I thought, my car's on Broadway. I'm going to get another. 502, that'll be three of them. 502 is what they used to give you before the other one, you know, what I got now. <laughs> anyway, this, this, uh, I got in my car and I drove it right a block from my house. And I parked it so that I could walk home. And I went in a turf club and I ordered, I kept ordering drinks and tell them, hurry up, I'm in a hurry, I'm, I only got a, about a half hour to go, this is after midnight. And, uh, so I bought a bottle of vodka and I met a blonde and I took the blonde and the vodka home. She might be in this room now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And they had a drinking party. And the cops came. They took her, I guess, because she disappeared. And they took, the, you know, they, they closed the, my bar. <laughs> I woke up in the morning and I'm looking at uh, three fingers of vodka on the refrigerator. And I thought, uh, if I drink that, I got to go get more. To get to the refrigerator, I had to walk four steps. And I thought, I can pick up the telephone, and I wouldn't have to walk. And I talk, called up Nina from South Bay. She passed away a long time ago. But she she's the one I talked to. I talked to her 10 minutes. I didn't need a drink. I knew I didn't have to drink at all. And I hadn't had a drink since. And that's the way it went. I did a lot of things in my time. It's still going around. <clears throat> I made 34 trips to Slovakia, Czechoslovakia, sneaking books in during the communist era. Taking things, you know, may I was, I helped them start a few meetings and I helped uh, wherever I could. I, I would never claim to start the group, but, uh, I was there when we started them. Yeah. And I, I appreciate the opportunity I had to start some Slovak groups and get all my relatives to get help. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful that I had this opportunity to do this. You yeah. know, it's, it's really good. Thank you. I'm Dana. I am a real alcoholic. Um, I don't mess around with alcohol. <laughs> um, but it's uh, welcome to the newcomers. Happy birthday to Barbara. I'm not really sure where she went. Happy birthday. Two years is an um, amazing thing. One hour is an amazing thing. Um, and all the old timers, everyone's here. Um, I got sober on July 29th of 1998. I was 19. And I had reached the end of my five-year drinking career. Um, I love, um, you know, meetings that um, start with um, more about alcoholism because I was very unwilling to admit that I was a real alcoholic. And um, I identify as having a drinking career because um, after a few years in sobriety, I looked up the definition of career, and it was a lifelong pursuit. Um, I had a lot of lifelong pursuits prior to drinking alcohol. Once I took my first drink of alcohol, everything went out the window, including friends and family and a desire to live. Um, and all that I cared about was alcohol, and yet I 
took me, it took me many, many, many years in AA before I could even see that, uh, I was powerless over alcohol because I thought my problem was all these other things. My problem was my family. My problem was all of you. My problem was food. I had, you know, eating men, money, <laughs> all these things. And, um, I, I am not capable of living in this world without relying upon something or someone else. And what this program, this program Alcoholics Anonymous has not, 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 not necessarily been the solution, but has put me in contact with a solution. It's put me in touch with a power greater than myself, a power greater than alcohol, which is huge. Um, and without which I would not be here tonight. Um, and one thing that I was thinking of, um, I'll share, I'll try to share as much as possible in the 10 minutes. Um, but one thing I was thinking of before I got here was my sponsor said something to me once when I was really struggling with, um, what an alcoholic is, if I really am one, what this powerlessness thing is. Um, and my, and God, I was really struggling with God. I wanted nothing to do with God or any of you <laughs> or anything really. <laughs> And uh, my sponsor said to me, you know, maybe uh, God can use you. Maybe you have a purpose here. And no one in my life had ever said it in that way. And I didn't, you know, I had wasted, ever since I took my first drink, I had wasted my life away to where, I mean, I was suicidal many, many times. Um, and I couldn't get my stuff together. I couldn't get my life together. I couldn't figure out what my problem was, but I knew that I had a problem. And, um, and I had no concept that I could actually be of service to anybody else, um, let alone what I want to share any of the things that I had gone through in my life with somebody else. So it's an amazing thing, um, you know, to be able to share with another alcoholic and help someone from the wretched experiences that I've had. And some, some were great, but, um, I'll go back, <laughs> I'll go back a little bit, um, to, um, prior to taking my first drink, um, I was already a full blown alcoholic. I had no, um, concept. I couldn't tell the truth from the false. Um, and, uh, when I would see, I mean, from a very, very young age, I was felt different, felt very different. Um, and was constantly comparing myself to other people. And when I took my first drink of alcohol. Um, I'll also say that my family told me many, many, many times that alcoholism runs in the family. So I was forewarned. I had a lot of ominous warnings, um, <laughs> which I completely ignored and, um, and meant nothing to me again. So I took my first drink of alcohol at 15 and from then on out, you know, I, I did, I had prior to that, I had, I was always really a, like, um, really excited or afraid. I had all these different emotions. Um, but once I started drinking, it took all that away. And I was free, like a free bird, <laughs> completely free, which I'm sure everyone in this room can relate to. Um, and when I didn't have alcohol in my system anymore, I was what they call restless, irritable, and discontent. Um, I didn't use those words to describe it, but I was very pissed off. Um, <laughs> And I wanted nothing to do with anybody. And I would, I mean, literally I, I would leave school, ditch school, um, told my family I hated them. I was a terrible, terrible child. <laughs> and, um, I had all these high hopes, you know, I relate to a lot in the big book newcomers. If you don't have a big book, I highly recommend you get one. Um, when I first read it again, you know, I got here at 19. I had, I had no idea how reading a story that was written about, you know, was written by men from the thirties. Um, how that could help me. And I had all these ideas about alcoholism and that it was, you know, when I, it took me a while to admit, you know, my thoughts of an alcoholic was someone passed out homeless in a gutter with a shopping cart and a paper bag. It wasn't me clearly. So I had a really hard time identifying that I was an alcoholic. And, and also, I mean, granted my life had been done at that point. Um, but I was 19 you know, I, I sat in these rooms and I stayed here because I had nowhere else to go at that point. I had done, I had traveled, I had done therapists, um, I had done 
antidepressants, all these different things, trying to exercise, all these different things, nothing worked. I kept getting, it was just this mad cycle and I couldn't understand it. So I got a sponsor. I worked the steps, did some inventories. Um, I was never honest in working the steps for the first two years in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, and my life fell apart. I was not happy. I was, you know, taking, I was taking tokens. I remember taking my two-year token and I was saying how happy I was and I was not happy. Um, and I did what I thought everyone wanted me to do and I couldn't understand why I was not feeling the promises. Um, the promises would be read and it just was, to me, it was like poetry that I wasn't experiencing. I had no idea of what this new freedom and new happiness was. And the truth was that I didn't want to be an alcoholic. I didn't want to be here. <laughs> And I certainly did not want to turn my will and my life over to God because that meant that I could never find that freedom that I had, that sense of ease and comfort that I found in alcohol that nothing else could give me. You know, like taking away alcohol is fill in the blank. You know, there's men, there's money, again, money, food, all these different things, sources of comfort, but nothing worked like alcohol did, not even drugs. Um, and so, you know, it took me a while um, before, and it took me a lot of bottoms. And I, I think, too, and, and I'll just say this, is that I, in sobriety, I was waiting around because I knew I, I got to that place of understanding alcoholism from getting honest, reading the book, looking up words, being of service, thinking of others. And I started to see I'm an alcoholic. This is what I am. But I still wasn't experiencing the promises. And... Um, and it took me, I think I was, I was waiting for something to happen. I was waiting for something to happen for it to get bad enough, which I did also when I was drinking before I got here, waiting for like life to get bad enough. And the thing is when I was drinking, shit got bad. <laughs> it got bad more than once. And I would still drink or I would still use or whatever it was. And no one could figure out why. So then I would start being like not sharing what I was doing. Because obviously I was nuts. And um, so in sobriety, you know, I ended up um, in a dishonest relationship with a man that um, did not work. And yet I kept finding myself back with that person. And it got bad. And it became, I, and I, I knew it and I saw it. And it took me many, many years before God changed, God did something for me that I couldn't do for myself. And I hit a bottom in sobriety that brought me to my knees and it brought me to God. And it brought me to an acceptance that has revolutionized my life. And, um, through this whole process process, I just encourage you to, you know, be honest, to have whatever you're having and, um, you know, find a sponsor who's recovered and really found a peace with God, you know, let go of letting go of prejudices and ideas about what sobriety is, what, what alcoholism is. Um, the, the truth I found in the big book of alcohol is Alcoholics Anonymous is real. And it doesn't matter what our present circumstances are that we can be sober and find a God as long as we're willing, honest and open enough to let that power show us. So thank you so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.